I was born in Newport. And as a matter of fact, I was born at home, not oh. in the hospital. Uh -huh. And I uh, was um, at 66 Kingston Avenue. And then, before, you know, right after that, my mother and father, my two brothers and I moved across the street to 65 Kingston Avenue and moved in with my grandfather. Mm -hmm. I came in a big house. Uh, where were your parents born? My mother was born in Middletown, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and my father was born right here in Newport. What was your dad's occupation? My father was a musician. Oh. Yeah, he played a uh, E flat alto sax. Oh. And uh, it was difficult for us because he was a musician and not, you know, uh, didn't have the skill, really, uh, until uh, World War II. Then he became a truck driver, a long distance truck driver, for the uh, torpedo station mm. during the war. And my mother was a domestic at the time. Um, my grandfather was a coal man. He worked for the Newport Coal Company for years. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Your grandfather was from Newport, too? No, my grandfather, uh, both my grandfathers were from Virginia. Uh, my grandfather on my mother's side was from Culpeper County, Virginia. And my grandfather on my father's side was from Petersburg, Virginia. Had they come up here then to Newport? Uh, when my point? grandfather came here with his wife uh, at a very early age, and he owned a large piece of property out in Middletown, I think around the area where the Naval Lodge is now, mm -hmm. and that's when my mother was born. And uh, then they sold that piece of property and moved into Newport. And, and that's where he, he died here. Uh, from, I guess about, um, about 15, 16 years ago. You said your mom's occupation was as a domestic. Yes. Mm -hmm. She worked pretty much full time at that? She worked, uh, yeah, well, in those days, they worked like eight and ten hours a day. Mm -hmm. You know, for a flat rate, they weren't paid by the hour. And they were, you know, for whatever it was, a week, fifteen dollars, twenty dollars a week, and that was like eight hours a day, mm -hmm. or eight or ten hours a day, from seven in the morning to seven at night, or like that. Twelve hours, I guess that is. And I remember spending most of my childhood with uh, my aunt, who lived across the street from us, and my that's my mother's brother. Mm -hmm. and his wife and they had three children and most of my life was spent with them because my mother was working days and my father was working nights mm -hmm. so um, you know, we were left alone a lot we were left with other people a lot mm -hmm. and your aunt uh, she didn't have outside employment outside of the house no she didn't she um, she was home with the children how many brothers and sisters did you have I had two brothers, two older brothers. Um, my brother next to me died at the age of 17. He was killed in an accident on Thames Street on Christmas Eve. Hmm. What was that, a car wreck? Uh, he was working on a coal truck. Um, and you know, they had the uh, trucks that lifted up in the back to dump the coal out. And it got stuck, and he went underneath the truck to pull the piece of coal out, and when he did, the whole thing came down on top of him, so he was crushed from the waist up. And it happened about 12 o'clock in the afternoon, the day before Christmas, and he died at five minutes after six Christmas Eve. Your other brother, uh, did, has he lived here in Newport? Only up until he was 18 years old, and then he went in the Navy. Mm -hmm. And um, he was uh, aboard the first USS Lexington when he was hit. Um, after he did about four years in the Navy, he got out. 
and made his home in California, and that's where he's been ever since. But he was on the Lexington during World War II, I yeah. guess. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of things do you remember that your uh, family enjoyed doing together? Well, we didn't really have that much time together. As I said, my father worked nights and my mother uh, worked during the day. She worked holidays, you know, as a domestic. Every holiday was, you know, a day that she had to work. So most of my holidays was spent, uh, you know, with uh, my aunt and her children. Few times, you know, we would uh, just have the holiday together. The things that we got for Christmas, we would just sit and play games. We played Monopoly and things like that together. Weekends, you didn't have too much time either on weekends. Mm -hmm. used to be. Mm -hmm. She worked every day. When you were growing up, where do you remember playing? Mostly in the streets. Mm -hmm. Mostly we played in the streets. Um, there was a, the playground, what we call the playground. And uh, when we could get there, we did. Uh, they had someone there to organize games and things like that for us. You know, but we weren't able to get there all the time. Not that it was a long distance off, it was just that we weren't allowed to go by ourselves. You know. yeah. so, and you know, we had, I had older brothers and they didn't want to be bothered with little sister tagging <laughs> them behind them. Uh, besides your, I, mean, I think you said besides your parents and your sisters, you did have other relatives living in Newport, grandparents. Mm -hmm. uh, Lots of relatives here. Yeah. Lots of relatives. Uh, my mother had uh, three brothers. They were all married and had children, so uh, a lot of first cousins. Um, on my father's side, uh, I only had uh, one aunt here that had two children. And the rest of his family was in New York. So, uh, that they were uh, the two children on my father's niece and nephew on, my, on his side were lots older than I, and so we didn't spend that much time together until we got up some age. I'd say about sixteen, and then we spent a lot of time together. And my cousin Billy and I were really close, very very close. Um, Many of your relatives lived in the same neighborhood. Yes, we all lived in the same neighborhood um, between uh, Kingston Avenue, Calum Avenue, Water Street, Brayside Avenue, around the neighborhood. So you saw a lot of them, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did anyone live uh, with you and your family, like lodgers or other relatives, in the same house? After the 1938 hurricane, uh, my cousin Billy and Avis and, and their mother May moved in with us. Uh, that was a real difficult time for all of us because we only had two bedrooms, a living room and a kitchen. My mother and father, three children, my aunt and her two children. Mm. So it was really crowded and the living room was made into a bedroom. It was just, you know, funking wherever you could. They were flooded out during the 1938 hurricane because they lived out in the 10th Street area. And they lost everything. Everything. So mm -hmm. they had no alternative but to move in with us. Mm -hmm. How long did they stay with you? I really don't know how long it was. It's, to me, right now, it doesn't seem like it was very long. Um, before they found another place. And then Avis and Billy were up some age, so they moved to New York with another aunt. Did your mother have uh, interests or other activities outside of the home in her uh, domestic environment? The one thing that I remember my mother uh, doing a lot was going to the movies once a week. And at that time, they used to give out uh, dishes 
each week they give you a plate or a sauce or a cup or something. And that's the way she got a set of dishes. Okay. I can I can remember that. It was the old Colonial Theater down on Thames Street. And she always made it her business to get to that movie at least once a week. <laughs> the Colonial was not there. Oh, no. Was no. it on the side of the street that it was mostly torn away for the redevelopment? No, I think it was on the other side of the street, if I can remember correctly. Mm -hmm. The building's just not there anymore. Oh, the building is not there anymore. What about your father? Uh, did he have other interests or activities outside of his, his occupation in the home? Not that I know. No. I don't remember him having anything to do musicals his whole life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed that. Did he engage much in uh, music after he began uh, driving truck? Yes, he still played his music. He had a couple of bands of his own. He, um, belonged to the union, the Musicians Union. He did a lot of things on weekends, like he used to go to New York and play with different bands. Mm -hmm. We met a lot of um, other famous uh, musicians through him. Mm -hmm. um, he played with um, Johnny Hodges, and, uh, mm -hmm. played with Chick Webb, played with Billy Holiday, um, mm -hmm. Earl Hines, Met a lot in Joe Williams and met a lot of awesome men. Hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll have some questions uh, next time about the jazz era and such in mm -hmm. Newport here. That should be interesting. Uh, your parents, did they talk with you very much about uh, about the future, about what you would be doing, or about uh, anything about the future? They were very interested in, in getting us all to get more of an education than they have. And I guess that's typical of any parent. They always want more for their children than what they have. Um, they weren't in a position to send us to school. They insisted that we finish high school, though. And uh, we all did except my, the middle brother. He, because he was, like I say, he was killed in the last time. He didn't finish school. But we all managed to finish high school. Um, I had the opportunity to go to um, dressmaking school in New York if I wanted to stay there with my aunt. But I, I didn't want to leave my mother. You know, I didn't want to go there and stay there for that length of time to finish school. So I was married as soon as high school was out. Mm -hmm. okay. Let me stop this one. Where did you go to school? I went to um, Cranston Calvert School for grammar school. Um, at that time, the two schools were separated. And, uh, and then they had, I went from kindergarten to the third grade there. And then I went from the third grade to the sixth grade at Cogshire School on here there in San Avenue. Um, in fact, I was in culture school when the 1938 hurricane came in. Hmm. And then we went, I went from culture school to Mumford School, to Virginia High School, about seventh and eighth grade, and then to Rogers High School. And, uh, what about your school experiences? Uh, did you find them valuable for yourself? Uh, I can remember, um, I can remember a few teachers that had a, a lot of influence in my life at the time. At the time, I thought they were very, very strict, you know, mm -hmm. very stern and very strict. And, um, some things that they told me at that time that I was going to school, I guess I didn't have a very positive attitude about myself. And. Uh, but they really talked to me over the time that I was in their class and made me feel better about myself. And I can remember those teachers today. Hmm. You know, Miss Mackey, Miss Hay. Uh, those, they were the teachers that nobody else liked uh, in the school because they thought that they were very strict. But they were very nice to me. You know. And I remember them as, as I think I re remember getting more out of their classes hmm. than I do out of any other class. 
I wasn't that great a student going through um, grammar school and junior high school, but my average when I got to high school was very good. Looking at some skills beyond education or having to do with the edu education a little bit, did you pick up a certain uh, number of skills from your parents? No. no I, I, don't, I don't think I've learned any skill uh, from e either one of them. Um, Unless it was through formal education. The things that I, that I learned in school, the things that I learned uh, since I hit 40 years old, I had to go back to, to school and um, get some skills in order to take care of myself and my children. You mentioned, uh, just mentioned uh, education beyond high school. What other training and education did you have? Well, I went to Rutgers, um, Rutgers University Summer School Studies for Alcohol Studies. When my husband and I first broke up, I took a job as a clerk typist for the alcohol program. And I was just fascinated with the information that was there. And it, it just seemed like over the years, I just got so much knowledge from working with one particular man, uh, Mr. Joe Bravo, and got really interested in it, in it. So I went to summer school studies, and I went for six weeks up there. I came back, I went to Yale University School of Medicine for a three-week course there. Um, outside of that formal education, I went to Salve uh, for a year for sociology and psychology. And every workshop, every conference from here to uh, Charlottesville, North Carolina, I was there. Hmm. For the, for On the Yes. Yeah. And uh, counseling seems to come very easily with me. Um, it just seems like people want to talk to me. People mm -hmm. would call me up and talk over the phone. I still get a lot of calls um, from people who need help, uh, whether it's an alcohol program or an uh, alcohol problem or something else. Uh, people seem to want to talk mm -hmm. to me and it, it comes easy with them, so. Counseling is, was a, just a natural thing for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. huh. I do have clerical skills. I went to executive secretarial school. Uh, it, it, it came in handy when I was director of the alcohol program because I did all my own secretarial work. Mm -hmm. I took some uh, writing. I learned how to write grants the government. And um, I, I put a lot of that uh, knowledge into writing the grants to keep that program going, mm -hmm. along with the program, the regular program plan and the vision. Could you uh, cover that for a moment uh, about your your uh, occupation as uh, the director of the alcohol mm -hmm. rehab unit here in town? That's in Newport. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I started with them in 19 uh, June 1970, and I started out as a clerk typist, and then secretary, and then counselor, and then program director, and. Uh, it was with me and two of my counselors wrote a program for the school department for um, alcohol studies for the health classes in the ninth grade. Mm -hmm. And that came through my daughter, who was at the time uh, at um, Thompson Junior High School. And they were talking about alcohol studies, and she seemed to know so much about it. The health teacher wanted to know how she knew so much about mm -hmm. alcohol, and she told them about me. So they contacted me and asked me to give a talk on alcohol for the school. 
So we got together, the councils and myself, and wrote a program up, and we presented it to the school department. And it started out like a two-day thing, and then it was three days, but the next year it was a week. The next year it was a two-week program, all the way up to a four-week program. Mm -hmm. Went from Thompson Junior High to Middletown to Portsmouth, and then we did the contemporary issues classes at Rogers High School. Um, we had films, uh, people from AA, people from Alateen, Alan on, they came in and spoke. Uh, we had, um, and you know, we gave lectures ourselves, and, and we would switch up, you know, while one was at Portsmouth, someone would be at Middletown, someone would be at Rogers, you know. And it, it turned out to be a, a very, very good program. Uh, to the point where they are, last year we're thinking about incorporating it into the regular health classes. Mm -hmm. But that started with, um, with me as program director. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not that we're getting any credit for it, but uh, it did start with us. Mm -hmm. Those were, I worked that program for, for eight years mm -hmm. um, before I got into employment counseling. And one of the counselors that, uh, that I had hired became the program director, and she's still program director now. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it's, pr it's principally an uh, educational and outpatient facility. Yes, um, it's it's individual and family counseling too. Mm. Yeah, they do that. Um, transportation, uh, referrals. It, it, it turned out to be a pretty good program. We had a lot of problems in uh, getting people into Newport Hospital being diagnosed with alcohol. Uh, they, when they did take them in, they were diagnosing you know, uh, anything but alcoholism. Mm -hmm. And we were instrumental in getting them taken to the Newport Hospital and admitted you know, under that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. We were given a key to the emergency room so that we wouldn't have to go through uh, the lobby, you know, and taking them in. We could go over in the emergency room mm -hmm. and have a doctor look at them and have them admitted. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think they do that now. I, think, I don't think they have that problem of, of uh, trying to get them in. Uh -huh. uh, before we had to transport them to uh, Cranston, mm -hmm. to Stony Farms in Connecticut. You know, any place that you put out there, mm -hmm. they wouldn't take them. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, about religion. Uh, did your parents go to uh, church? Yeah. Yeah, my parents were Baptists. My grandfather on my mother's side was a deacon of, a, of a, what at the time was Mount Olivet Baptist Church for 50 years. My mother is now a deaconess in the Baptist Church. Hmm. My father sang in the choir. He had a nice tenor voice. Church, uh, was that the church? It's the Mount Olivet Baptist Church was the name of it uh, up until about, I think about six years ago, it became Community Baptist Church. We joined with Shiloh Baptist and Mount Olivet Baptist joined together, so it's now called Community Baptist. We just built a brand new church on this Broadway. Oh, yes, is that near the, uh, a block or so from the Park? Yes. Right next to yes. the good that's on my that corner there. Yeah. Pretty modern church. Yes, it is. It's a beautiful inside. I'm very proud of that. Uh, how usually did your family spend uh, a Sunday? What you usually do? You, well, my mother and father were firm believers that if you didn't go to church, you couldn't do anything else. Mm -hmm. So it was Sunday school in the morning, and then 11 o'clock service, 
and we came home for dinner and we were we spent Sundays together which is a tradition that I kept going with my children that Sundays was the day that then we should be together and um, we just looked laid around we played games watched um, played games and had dinner together Sunday evenings at six o'clock we went to what we call BYPU and uh, it was like a, a Bible class at 6 o'clock at night, and then 7.30 was um, evening services. Now, Mother and Dad didn't go every Sunday evening, but most of the children did. Mm -hmm. Then on um, Sunday nights, we used to have a, a, two people used to come by and bring. Uh, my mother loves ice cream. Mm -hmm. She loves ice cream. And this friend of ours named Mary would come by. Sunday night and bring a big box of ice cream and another friend Clarence would come back and bring Chinese food and we would play Monopoly and eat Chinese food and ice cream that was where we spent Sunday night. Mm -hmm. so, I can remember my mother when storms, when we had storms on Sunday night she'd make everybody sit on the floor, we'd put down a blanket sit on the floor and she would tell us different stories. You know, that's to keep us from being afraid of the thunder and the lightning. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Vespers, would you all be going to Vespers? Uh, was there, was there a lot of bad school? Yeah, we have, yeah, we have that called prayer meeting. You know, Bible study and prayer meeting on Wednesday. So, um, I didn't go, I, not until I was grown. My mother still goes, and she's 80 years old, but mm -hmm. she never misses. Do you remember special uh, prayers or religious uh, ceremonies or observances in your home growing up? No, no special. You know, we were taught to say grace and say, you know, the Lord's Prayer every night before you go to bed and that was uh, things like that. But we don't really have special prayers, you know. We pray from what comes out of our heart. We're, Whatever we feel, we pray, is what we say. But we don't have special prayers that are just written down and you learn. We don't have things like that. Uh, on religious holidays, uh, like Christmas, Christmas, Easter, and such, uh, how would you spend those? In church. Mm -hmm. In church. Uh, uh, probably an extra special dinner. You know. Mm -hmm. um, maybe some friends in with, for dinner with us. Whatever we had, what little bit we had, we shared with the rest of the family. They would share with us. But no special things we would do. And I think we used to look forward to Easter and, and uh, things like that because it meant a new dress or new hat or something like that. And I think most people look for the, the same thing now. Looking back for a moment at the, uh, the neighborhood, uh, the neighbors uh, around you, was there often a lot of uh, close communication or talking with neighbors, uh, some friendly neighbors? And yeah, I think it was a very friendly neighborhood. Um, it was always a very mixed neighborhood. Uh, I'm sorry, what do you mean by mixed? Racially mixed. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were uh, Cape Verdeans, Black, um, Portuguese, Italian, Greek, and Jewish people there. Mm -hmm. And we all got along fine. Mm -hmm. We never had any trouble. You know, there was no name calling. People visited each other. We spent nights at, at different people's houses, you know. And uh, we got along fine. I don't remember any real crime being in the neighborhood. We never locked our doors. You know, we'd go out, close the door, and go where we wanted to go and come back, and everything was all right. Mm. Uh, I remember this being a very warm and a very friendly neighborhood. And, uh, everybody knew everybody else. Uh, everybody's parents disciplined every, every child. If you were doing something, and my next door neighbor it could be a Greek lady, if she saw me doing something, she knew my mother wouldn't like it. She would discipline me and tell my mother when she came home, you know, and that's the way we grew up. 
Did you have any feeling for whether a majority of the neighborhood or less than a majority of the neighborhood were old uh, Newporters or Rhode Islanders like you and your family? Most people didn't come from Rhode Island. Um, most of the older people, as I remember, came here from, from Virginia and, you know, different places in the South. In your neighborhood? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of the Cape Verdeans were from the old country, you know, Cape Verde Islands, and the Portuguese were from Portugal. You know, they still had the accent, you know, uh, some couldn't speak English, but the children were born here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You spoke of the, uh, the helping and friendly into the neighborhood. Uh, were there times uh, that you recall when some of the neighbors were really angry with each other or would, would get mad at each other over certain things? Or? I don't recall them, uh, you know, anything. We had one woman in the neighborhood who was picky, who, you know, just found fault with everything. And, you know, like we had a big pear tree in my aunt's yard. And we would climb that pear tree and shake it to knock all the pears out. And the tree was not in her yard, but she would fuss because we would climb that pear tree. Uh, you know, if we walked the fence, you know, we used to have climb up on the fence try to walk the fence without falling. She would scream and yell about that. If we played in the street, she would scream and yell about that. <laughs> you know. At the time, the houses were built close together and there were no... We didn't have cars, so there were no driveways, and it, there were like alleyways between the houses, you know, and we really didn't have that much in the back um, for a yard, and so we, there was no place to play but in the street, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we watched for the cars. I don't remember anybody really getting hit by a car or anything, but this lady would fuss with us about everything that we did or said, year after year. I remember when I bought my house in 1966, and when I saw it in the paper, it was the only one that we really could have bought. And I said, oh no, it's right across the street from this lady, you know, and I dreaded going up there. And when she saw it was me that bought the house. Oh my goodness, now I have to be bothered with all these screaming children, you know. And I, did, I tried to ignore her and just let it go. But she was a husband. She's the only one that I can remember in that neighborhood that uh, had something to say, you know, about what went on. Everybody else got along well. Pretty well. Do you remember any special ways that the uh, neighborhood celebrated the holidays, or any particular holidays they celebrated together? We did have black parties. We used to back off the street mm -hmm. and have black parties on um, like 4th of July. 4th of July was the day that everybody out was out with. Um, at that time, we were allowed to have firecrackers. Mm -hmm. you know, and we would save our pennies and nickels so that we could buy everything. And the streets would be just full of kids and adults out there with fire practice. Um, in the summertime, I guess there was block parties and people would have their Kool-Aid and their hot dogs and things like that out there. And music, you know. Um, most, those were two of the things that I remember. Most of the block parties were not spontaneous. They were really celebrations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, planned. Yeah, they were planned. Um, ahead of time because we had to get permission from the police department to block off those streets. Was there a person in, in your neighborhood that played some particular role like he was uh, head of the neighborhood or one of 
one person that particularly stood out in, in the area of leadership. I don't think he lived in our neighborhood. He didn't live in our neighborhood, but he was a black man who played a, a, a role in our lives as children. Um, his name was Henry Cross, and he started, uh, he had a Boy Scout troop. Uh, he had the Naval, um, Newport Youth Federation Band. Uh, he started getting us involved in uh, uh, theater. And, uh, different things like that to keep us out of the street. Mm -hmm. He didn't live right in that neighborhood. He lived in the hill section of, of the Bellevue Avenue mm -hmm. up in there. But he uh, would come to the community center and organize all these things to keep us out of trouble. And uh, we stayed in touch with him for a long time. He died about two years ago. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he would come back to Newport, you know, he and his wife as well as mine. You mentioned that the neighborhood uh, was fairly close together. The buildings were. There wasn't, mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't much need for garages, not too many cars. Do you remember that not that many cars parked in the street or not that many cars came down the area? Um, I guess there were quite a few cars. We didn't own any cars. There were people that came maybe to visit us or something like that, but there weren't that many cars out there. Uh, my father had a car, uh, but only, I think, I don't remember him having a car until I must have been 11 or 12 years old. It's the first time I remember him having a car and it was parked in the street. I can look at it, when I go through the neighborhood now and look, most every house has a driveway at least. You know, they may not have garages, but they have opened the, the space up and put the driveway so they have off street parking there. But, um, Back to when you were a child, looking at uh, some uh, things on child care and such. Uh, you mentioned that it was the uh, your aunt and uncle across the street who did a lot of the child care for you. Mm -hmm. uh, they apparently were principal in your life, I guess, during the daylight hours, I guess, because both yeah. parents were gone. Mm -hmm. uh, they then, I guess, did most of the disciplining of y'all during the, during the daytime? Yes. Um, I, well, my aunt and I are still very close. And, uh, it was my mother's brother. He worked uh, during the day, and he was a very quiet person. Uh, when he came in from work, you, you didn't hear anything from him. So my aunt did most of the disciplining, whatever there was to do. I don't think she had much trouble with us. She had two daughters and a son. And, um, I don't think that we were that big of a problem. I don't remember getting any whippings. Uh, I know I used to, I, at five years old, I was very spoiled, and I did know how to call on the telephone, and I would call my mother at this place where she worked and cry because I couldn't unbutton the button on my dress, or I couldn't tie my belt, or. You know, I couldn't find a pair of pants to put on when I changed my dress. And she would say, go across the street to your aunt. And at first I didn't want to go, but after I got used to going over there, it was okay. And then they couldn't keep me away from it. But she, I don't think she had any problem in disciplining us. The only thing she used to get after us about was uh, her youngest daughter had polio. She couldn't walk, and she was in a uh, stroller. And we would be on, want to go to the movies, Loretta and I. And didn't want to take Madeline mm -hmm. because you know, we had to place the stroller in the theater, and, and we couldn't go upstairs in the balcony. We had to sit downstairs. You know? mm -hmm. And we would spell out the word, can we go to the S-H-O-W? And 
Madeline knew what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. So then we learned how to spell movie and spell it. <laughs> she knew what that was about too. And that was the only time that she used to really get behind us and say, no, you have to, you have to take her some time too. Do you remember uh, any other things uh, that y'all were forbidden to do or were severely disciplined about if you did? One of the things that I think my aunt and my and my mother were both very strict about, and that was talking about what went on inside your house. Mm -hmm. Whatever we did, whatever problems we may have had in the house, whatever we did wrong or whatever we were spanked for was to stay right there in that house. It was not to be repeated outside. They were very, very strict about that. The other was, we were not allowed to walk uh, on West Broadway. Yeah. West Broadway had a very, very bad name at that time, and we were not allowed on West Broadway. If we were going to the community center, we had to go down Warner Street and go around, or we had to go down Broadway and go around. But we were not allowed on one street on uh, West Broadway. Uh, those are two of the things that I can remember. Mm -hmm. They were very strict about. Uh, what was the reputation of West Broadway? Well, I think because there were uh, kinds of uh, gambling houses there, uh, prostitution going on. Um, just men hanging on corners. Pool halls, you know, just that type of a street at that time. Mm -hmm. And it gained a reputation and it never lost it. I think that it's one of the reasons why they're doing the things that they're doing down there now is to, to change that image. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit about uh, neighborhood and social mm -hmm. contacts. Um, mm -hmm. How long? How long did you live in that West Point? Right up until, uh, well, I spent six years in Virginia, and I've been here in this apartment about nine years. So practically all of my life was spent on some street in that neighborhood. You chose, I guess, at some point to to live in that neighborhood or to go back to it, to remain in it. Do you remember why you chose that? Well, I don't know. I, I kind of liked the neighborhood, and I I think when I came back um, to Newport in Virginia, it was more or less because we thought we could find a place that we could afford to rent. Also because Although I never tried it, I did not think that we would be accepted in, in a lot of other neighborhoods because of race. It's a myth to think that there's no racism in this world, because there is. It's just very underhanded, you know, covert. So. Yeah. Um, and there were no other neighborhoods at that time that you felt they would accept y'all. No, um, the fact that we didn't think that we could pay the rent in some of those neighborhoods. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So we came back to that to that area, and when we were able to buy, we bought in that area. Um, but the but the neighborhood has been changing for the past um, twenty five years. You know, we can see. Um, a lot of changes going on in the neighborhood. The older people uh, that live there have died off, and they probably left their property to people coming up with me. They had better education, better jobs, and so they moved out of the neighborhood and sold their property. Your peer groups? Yes. They, um, well, we have the mayor, and the former mayor of Newport, and the postal. Uh, postmaster of Newport. We were all going in that neighborhood around the same time. Hmm. And uh, 
as they, you know, they went to college and got good education, they did come back to Newport, but they brought home for another parts of town. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, they, I guess, sold the property off or rented it out or what have you, but they didn't move back in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. There were um, a lot of the fellows that were in the Navy with my husband bought property in that area, and that's when we began to see a change. They were buying the houses and fixing them up, and that's when the changes started coming about. You know what years roughly that was? Uh, 63, 64, 65, around there. And we came around 66 when we bought ours. And there were quite a few Navy men that were buying the property then. And they still own it. Mm -hmm. And they fixed the houses up to the point where they're worth seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars now. Mm -hmm. Were they Navy people who were from that neighborhood or had gone no, back to it? Was a, well, some of them married Newport girls. Some of them came here with their wives and decided once they got out of the Navy that they would settle here. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the fellow that bought the house next to mine married a Newport girl. And uh, we bought our houses about the same time. Uh, and on the other side of him, married a girl from Florida, I think, and he's from Philadelphia. And they bought a house there and fixed it up. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, or the one on the corner from me uh, is Navy Chief. And his wife, uh, he sold it to another Navy man. And they moved to Texas. But all around in that neighborhood are a lot of retired Navy men. What are some of the uh, major changes that you'd say that you've seen in the neighborhood since you were there and how it is now? I don't feel, um, well, I, I know that the, the houses have been all fixed up. There have been driveways made so cars can get in and out. Um, I think the major change is just the, the renovation of all the buildings there and the tearing down of those that aren't worth renovating and clearing them away, not just closing them up, you know, not just leaving them um, half burnt out and things like that. Um, it's becoming a mixed neighborhood again. Uh, it, had, it was a mixed neighborhood when I was a child. It started going toward a black neighborhood, okay, and now it's becoming, it's going around again to a mixed neighborhood again. Hmm. Um, the same mix as when you were a child? I, I really couldn't say about that because these are younger people and I guess they're moving here from all over. I don't know, um, I think some of them are from other parts of town who felt like because of the um, community development money things that were going on in the neighborhood that they could buy cheaply in that neighborhood and fix it up. So some of them may be from other neighborhoods right here in Newport, Middletown, Portsmouth, whatever. And some of them, I guess, are retired Navy people. I don't know whether, they, I know they're white, but I don't know, you know what nationality they're Italian or Greek. But I do see a mix. Can you describe why you, in growing up, uh, why you liked your house? If you did like it, I'm not sure we covered that. Uh, well, I liked my grandfather's house because it was really large. Hmm. And um, I, don't, I don't know, I guess the, the, the family, the closeness that we shared there. It was warm, and, and we just had a good time, everybody being there. When my mother and father and my two brothers and I moved to this other house on Stewart Street, it was very small. Uh, we had to share a room. Uh, it didn't have, um, you know, the same facilities that we had in the big house. Uh, my father was you know, would sleep days, so the house had to be extra quiet because he would work nights and sleep days. 
My mother would be gone all day long. And I spent most of my time with my aunt. You know, it got to the point where I would rather have been there rather than be home. You know, not being able to listen to the radio or have any friends in because my father was sleeping. So as soon as I could, I'd get out of the house. Did most of the people uh, own their own homes at that time? Were gone? There were quite a few that owned their own homes. Do you remember an occasion when uh, neighbors got together to help someone and then they left? Some family was in trouble and so on. I think most of the time when you saw them, the neighborhood come together, there was a big fire. There, there were quite a few fires in the neighborhood, mm-hmm. and people were burned out. And that's when we saw the neighbors come together and, uh, and t- take these people in, and, you know, give them food and clothing and furniture and, and things like that. But that's most of the time we saw them really come together and help. At a death, uh, we would, someone in the neighborhood died. The rest of the family never had to worry about anything because the neighbors and friends would all be there with plenty of food. They didn't have to worry about cooking because the neighbors would cook and bring the food in and put it there, you know. And someone would uh, keep the housework done and someone would take care of the house while the family went to the funeral hall and had to wake and things like that. So at those times, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's not a fairly close neighborhood. Was there much? You recall there was much transience in the neighborhood. Uh, were people there a, a relatively long period of time in their homes? There wasn't mm-hmm. much selling and buying going on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. People were there. People stayed there. Uh, were there stores at that time in the neighborhood that you shopped on? Oh, yeah. Those are the new neighborhood stores. One on almost every corner. Hmm. Yeah, uh, on Heath Street, there was a Greek lady that had a little store. And right down the street on the corner of Heath Street and Kingston Avenue, on the right hand side, there was a Cape Verdean lady, Mrs. Smith, who had a little store. And across the street from her was Mr. Pashakov, who was a Jewish man who had a little store. <laughs> and then there was another Cape Verdean lady. Calendar Avenue and Davis Court, Mr. Liz Bower, who had a little corner store there. Mm-hmm. And on the corner of Pond Avenue and West Broadway was um, Mr. Adelson. Mm-hmm. Adelson, I think his name was, had a store there. And on the corner of West Broadway, right now is uh, just an empty lot there, was. Um, Another group, uh, Aidenau, had a little store there. And down where the Blue Pelican is now was another little store, um, Mr. Dasher. So all, you know, just about on every corner you had a little corner store that sold coal and ice and um, uh, wood. You know, we used to buy a bag of coal to be so long, you know, and buy a bag of coal for the old coal stoves. Mm-hmm. And uh, you could run a bill, because if you didn't have enough money to buy groceries, uh, you could go in the store and charge it. And at the end of the week, when you know your parents got paid, they'd pay some on that bill. And they, but that bill never really paid up unless the store was going to close. It, just, it was just a running thing, you know. But, uh, yeah, I remember very well all the little stores, the Penny Candy. <laughs> So y'all did most of your shopping there too? Yes. We didn't have any, uh, I don't recall any real large supermarkets. Uh, And I don't recall people really going to the grocery store and and standing, you know, like we do, if we go to the commissary, $60, $70, and have two or three weeks groceries. I don't recall Mm. ever doing that until I was almost grown. Mm because we always shopped at those little stores, not thinking that things were much higher there than they would be in a supermarket. Mm-hmm. You know? 
in the shopping line for food items was more on a daily or every other day? A basis? daily basis, yeah. And you went to the store and bought what you were going to eat for supper that night. I remember uh, lots of times where we didn't think about breakfast and lunch, but just supper. You know, breakfast and lunch was with whatever you could pick up, whatever was there you ate, you know. Yeah. And, but supper was a meal that we all sat down together. Do you remember special places nearby in the neighborhood or in the neighborhood that you really used to like to go to? I think the most uh, popular place that I liked to go to was the community center. Uh, they had everything there. Did you, you say know? that was the... the that was what we called the Quaker Meeting House. Yeah. That was what we called the wreck. And uh, that was our name for it, the reactor. Was it wasn't rather sure. run down? <laughs> it, well, well, it was a very old building, and, and it was run down, but we called it the wreck for short for recreation. And outside, it was a playground, you know, with sandboxes and swings and tennis courts and softball fields and, you know, slides and things like that. So uh, when we were able, when we were able to get there, that's the one place that I loved to go. Um, as we got older, it was basketball and um, theater groups, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, um, things like that inside. And um, I remember we had a newspaper during World War II. And we would put together this newspaper. And there were about 25 servicemen from Newport that I knew that I would write to and send them all these newspapers so that they would know what was going on in their hometown. <laughs> At that time, uh, did your folks talk about moving very much or they felt that they were going to stay there in the neighborhood? Uh, they never talked about moving. I, it's, they seemed to be very content being where they were. They talked about having more space, but they never really made any move. Mm -hmm. Where did most, uh, if you could say most, where did most of the people in the neighborhood seem to work? Let's see. I don't know, in my own small little space there, I think most of them were for coal companies, ice companies, um, up until the war, and then most everybody went to the torpedo station. Mm -hmm. With the expansion of the, of the torpedo station? Yes, at that time it was like, almost like people had worked on their neighbor base. Everybody worked at that torpedo station, men and women. And that's when I began to see, notice that um, people were beginning to, to uh, buy cars, people were beginning to uh, mm. dress better, uh, you know, were buying things because the pay was so much better than being a domestic or working for a coal company or something like that. Mm. And people began to get up on their feet at that time. Were there very many single people in the neighborhood, or was it mostly families? Um, most of my friends, I don't remember their fathers. I don't know whether they died or, you know, or had gone away, but a lot of my friends was just the mother and the children. There were always, always three or more children. Mm -hmm. Very seldom we saw a family with just one child. I had one girlfriend who was the only child. I believe you have described a uh, neighborhood feeling, it sounds like, from your description. Mm -hmm. Is it possible, and it's difficult to do, but is it possible to put that feeling into words? Uh, Sum it up in a few words. Well, I guess it was a very warm and comfortable feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you, I just felt comfortable with these people, you know, at home with them. Most of, because most of your friends that uh, you associated with, play with, do they live there in the neighborhood? Oh yes. Okay. And school friends too. We all went to school together. We all played together. Um, what did you like most about your neighborhood? I guess the fact that we everybody knew everybody. Um, you know you. You didn't have any fear. I, I mean, if I if I let the time slip by and didn't get home at six o'clock when I was supposed to be there, I had no fear of walking through the streets to go home. I knew that I knew everybody through that neighborhood. Strangers didn't seem I didn't seem to come into the neighborhood, you know. so we had no fear of, of walking the streets. Um, we knew that we could stop in anybody's house mm -hmm. and uh, and feel safe. Even though Broadway, West Broadway, was just one street over. So. Even it, it was right there, you know, right off. The, all we all lived in the short streets at the end, right off of West mm -hmm. Broadway. But uh, I had no fear of walking on West Broadway. It's just that our parents didn't want us down. Mm -hmm. you know, I, mean, I don't think anybody would have bothered us. What you like least? Probably uh, not having uh, a big yard to play in. You know, um, I mean, that's about the only thing. I, I, I think it was quiet enough for me at the time. Um, I just enjoyed it. I loved it. We're just about finished. Let me ask you a question about the, the wider community and participation. Mm -hmm. Were you involved in uh, any organizations or civic groups uh, at the time of growing up in, in the neighborhood? Uh, the Girl Scouts. Girl Scouts. I was a Girl Scout. Um, I also belonged to, uh, I, had, I played on a basketball team, I played on a softball team. Um, what else did These were neighborhood organized teams? Yes, it was a neighborhood team. Um, like I said, we had a little, uh, we had a, what we call it, a canteen. And we had um, a newspaper that we did. And then we'd go down to the back and we'd have hot dogs, instead of hot dogs and, and hamburgers and uh, play records and dance. And I think that that was my heart, my heart and soul was in music and dance. And as long as I could mm -hmm. hear music and I could dance, I was fine. Did you ever want to, at that time, join an organization uh, that felt you'd be excluded because of uh, race? No, I never really thought about it. I never really thought about it. Uh, I was just interested in the Girl Scouts. Although, I, now that I think of it, our troop was all black. Yeah, and I guess that's why we started it. Mm -hmm. Our leader was from New York, when she was originally from Providence. And evidently, that's why they started the Girl Scout Troop down there, because they didn't take class and do the Girl Scout Troop. Mm -hmm. I don't think that I ever remember anybody saying, you cannot join. Mm -hmm. But it was just like something, uh, an unwritten law, mm -hmm. you know, you just, don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, in the larger community at the time, uh, what would you rank? How would you rank the different groups in terms of political power? Was there you know, what particular groups seem to be in, in more in charge of the power, and less all the way down the line? Do you recall political power? Political, maybe social too, in the sense it seemed to have more influence. The the only thing I can say is it seemed like the Jewish people had more financial influence over anything than anybody else. You know, 
I don't think I paid much attention to any political power at the time. Although I get I think that maybe I may as well Irish. Who seemed to run the city at the time, do you remember? Was it a particular ethnic group like the Irish? I'm really not sure. Um, whoever was, there weren't any blacks involved, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. but, um, I really don't, I couldn't say. Okay. Summary question, big one. How do you feel about living in Newport? Had you asked me that? And uh, 20 years ago, I said I want to leave. Last time, we didn't finish up with the biographical data. And would you like to carry on then with uh, comments about your grandfather and your father's son? Yes. He was one of the first black businessmen in Newport. Um, he had a, a moving business, and he also ran a, a taxi service. I think at the time they called them hack drivers. And uh, I have one of his uh, hack licenses with a picture of him on that. You know, and, uh, I think my mother has one too. Uh, when they were cleaning out the city hall, they wanted to get rid of a lot of things that they had there. So mm. they called us and said that they had them and asked if we wanted them. So there were about four or five uh, different licenses going for each year. Mm. And uh, we just gave them to members of the family that wanted one. Mm. Starting in what year um, I can't remember what year it was, but uh, I don't think I was even born when he was driving here. Okay. Huh. Uh, he was living here in Newport uh, with his wife, I think. Yes, uh, they came here from Virginia, <coughs> yeah. and they bought a home at uh, 14 Warren Street, which is still in the family. Oh. Uh, it's still wrong for the family. Uh, this evening we uh, are going to touch on some subjects. Uh, the summer colony, much of that may be before your, uh, before your time and your, even before some of your parents' time. But your mom was a, a domestic. Would, right, you, would yeah. you like to mention a little bit about what you recall about her work as a domestic and where she worked? What I recall most was the long hours. Uh, it seemed to me that she would leave early in the morning and it would be, you know, like, uh, late at night when she got back, I'd say they worked a good 10 or 12 hours a day. Um, she worked for a couple of families here in Newport. Um, one I know very well, the conscious that lived for both in Newport for uh, Summer Street. And uh, I can remember uh, Thursdays was the day off for the maids. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I would, uh, sometimes she would go in just like part-time, just half a day on that day, work a couple hours and come home. But she did everything. She did the cleaning, the laundry, the cooking, the serving, you know, um, taking care of the children, you know, mm -hmm. everything. But, um, she, and she's very fond of that particular family that she worked for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She worked as a domestic for years, I think, right up until... Um, just before the, the, she went to the torpedo station. You know, World War II. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, about how many years then did she work as a domestic? Was she, um, she started. Uh, she st four well, years I born. think when I was, I was about four years old when I knew that that's what she was doing. I realized that's what she was doing. She wasn't at home. But she was working, and uh, so she worked for the commercials. I think. And people who the Boston store in the crowds. Then she went to a Swedish hand laundry for a little while. She worked there and then from there to the um, torpedo station. A Swedish hand laundry? Was yes, that? that was, it was a Swedish, well, they called the Swedish hand laundry. It was owned by a Swedish woman. Everything was done by hand, washed and ironed by hand. Very fine clothing. Oh, and everything was done by hand. She worked there for a little while. Okay. She, she didn't work for any of the people that were part of the summer colony. She worked for the you No, know, she worked for the people that lived here year-round. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
she would work for several families at one time? Yes. Hire her on different days? Yes. She, you know, like you might work for this family Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and then Tuesday and Thursday you would work for somebody else and you were paid daily. Oh, daily? Yeah. I see. You were paid daily. Do you know anything about how much she received at that time? Or wages were? No, I really don't. I should have asked her. I really don't. I think she could probably remember exactly what she made. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, the steamboats used to run up and down uh, Newport, and down the East Coast from Newport uh, for many years. Uh, you took uh, at least one trip, you said, on a uh, steamship. Yes, uh, when I was seven, uh, six years old, uh, my aunt, the one I told you about, raised me, um, took me and two of her children to uh, Culpeper County, Virginia. That was when we were going down to see where our grandparents lived. And um, we rode that steamship from Newport to New York. Mm. Uh, with, you know, it had to sleep in accommodation. And I can remember uh, standing on deck and looking over at the people on the dock and being really afraid because it just looked like it was so far down for me, <laughs> you know. Um, that was the, the only time that I ever rode that. Mm -hmm. I never forget that. You know? I turned seven years old while I was in Virginia. That's why it's easy for me to remember my <laughs> birthday down there. Oh, and you came back by the came back ship. by that. We came back from, from New York, to, from Virginia to New York by train. Mm -hmm. And then from New York to New York by the mm -hmm. And most of what you recall about it was the sleeping cabin. Sleeping, yeah, mm -hmm. we just to, to be able to sleep on a ship. And, you know, mm -hmm. that fascinated me. You know, I, did, I could not understand how they could stay on a ship overnight. Never <laughs> thought, of, I never knew about sleeping accommodations mm -hmm. and things like that. Do you remember anything about the uh, eating accommodations? Was there a restaurant? Do I don't remember. I don't remember. Was the sleeping room that stuck out? Yeah. Huh. Okay. Do you have some recollection, you said, of the <clears throat> end of the Depression era and what the Depression meant for you and your family? What happened? Mm -hmm. Uncle, I know that um, at that time jobs were, were not very plentiful. I know that it was very difficult for my father to find work because he was a musician and they had what they called the WPA at that time. I'm not quite sure of what the initials stand for, some kind of working association I guess. And um, my father was on the WPA but like I said, there wasn't much for him to do because he was a musician. Um, I remember that there was this place on Equality Park, and we used to call it the fire station. And we would go there and get dry beans and dry milk and uh, flour and cornmeal and that. And that was supposed to, we were given, it, it was given to us free because, you know, people didn't have jobs. You know, I, I guess it's like the uh, bread lines and things. We got, um, there was no meat available, I remember that. And we had bread, sometimes bread and a vegetable, or rice. And, you know, you put dry made milk and put milk over it and ate it for cereal, you ate it for a vegetable. Um, they also gave out clothes there. And I remember the dresses were made out of flour sacks. You know, they were printed flour sacks and they made dresses out of them. And what you didn't get already made, uh, your parents would make mm -hmm. from the dresses. Mm -hmm. I remember they gave out shoes, and girls and boys wore the same same style shoes. Mm -hmm. They were all black shoes, you know, tie-up shoes. Mm -hmm. And I used to be very, very well. I don't know. I think I had a, a a thing about clothes from a very early age, and I hated wearing those shoes. And they would just pass down from child to child. You know, if they if you didn't wear them out. If they got too small before they were worn out, they went to the next younger child. Uh -huh. You know, <laughs> and, you're <alive. laughs> and so I had two brothers, so I had to wear whatever yeah. they had. You know. Well, I got you. Huh. Yes, yeah, so that was it must have been toward the end, I guess, of the mm -hmm. depression. Just mm -hmm. World War II. I know several of the sidewalks uh, around the Point area have WPA on them, and some of the uh, piers. Yes, they were laid by people who worked for the WPA. So, um, they had um, 
people who pour concrete, you know, construction workers, whatever kind of work these people had skills in, the WPA would take them and give them jobs in that area, and all the jobs were fixing up the city. So that's why it was it was difficult for my father to find work because he was a musician, and what, you know, what were they going to do? Mm -hmm. You know, that would help the city. What could he do? Um, you mentioned he later went into uh, uh, driving a truck. Yes, that was at the torpedo station. When he went to work at the torpedo station, he became a long distance uh, truck driver. He drove trailer trucks. And he used to carry torpedoes from one uh, naval station to the other. Uh, his, he had a run from here to Alexandria, Virginia, uh, in Philadelphia, and he would be gone, you know, three, four, five days at a time. So, <clears throat> the hurricane of 1938. Uh, what do you recall of the hurricane that hit Newport? What I remember mostly is having to get out of school early that day. We were going to uh, college school on Van Zandt Avenue at that time. And there was a great big tree laying right across the front door. Uh, we started walking down the hill uh, toward home. And uh, it, it was just so windy and so and raining and everything that uh, my girlfriend's mother had a friend who had an ice truck. And he met us on the way and put us all in the truck and, and took us home. No lights. Uh, all we had naturally from, from the news of what was going on was the radio. And... Uh, if they weren't battery powered, you know, we, we didn't know what was going on. We just knew that wind was blowing and that it was a big storm. Uh, after the storm was over, every, naturally everybody wanted to get out and see what was going on. So we walked through the city, down by the beach, down by the uh, wharf, you know, all of Long Wharf around there. I had a, a cousin uh, and my aunt and her two children that lived down that way and they were flooded out and they came to live with us. We went down to see the house and water at that time was about, I guess about, about three feet. Mm -hmm. You could see the yeah. water line in her house. Everything was water soaked. Trees were down, you know, um, wires were down. Um, people we had lost furniture, clothing, everything. Um, that was the worst one we had ever had. There was quite a bit of water that came up into oh, yes. your neighborhood. Yeah, well, it came up as far as, about as far as the police station on Marlboro Street. Mm -hmm. See, Cary Hill, where I live, what we call Cary Hill, K-E-R-R-Y Hill, sits up higher than the rest of the city. Mm -hmm. So the water, you know, only comes so far whenever we have a storm. If, it, if the water rises, it only comes so far. And I think that's why that part of the West Broadway area is so popular with everybody because that's high ground. Oh. And uh, people really would like to, to be in that part of town. I think that the city fathers would also like to have that part of town <laughs> for um, the main, you know, the main street for or your shopping area and things like that because they wouldn't have to worry about it. Yeah. Um, water came over, there used to be a stone wall at Easton Beach water was over the wall and across the highway. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was terrible. You know? Did the hurricane change your life in any way that you recall at that time? I think the, the biggest change was the fact that the house was even more crowded after mm -hmm. the hurricane mm -hmm. than it was before, <coughs> before because we had three other people living there then. <coughs> and uh, like I said, th things were were very difficult financially then. And, uh, that made it even harder. Uh, no one was working. Uh, that made any amount of money anyway. Uh, there was no privacy then, you know, because uh, we had to share rooms, and, uh, sleep on floors, on pallets, and things like that. So. That was the biggest change in my life from that. 
Looking back, did you see any uh, change that the hurricane made to, to Newport permanently? I think that after um, some of the landmarks, I, I would, would imagine, like the Stonewall at Easton's Beach, that was gone. The amusement that were there, we had the um, carousel and things like that, those things were gone, and they didn't rebuild them for quite a while. Um, so it was a change in the way things looked. You know, we lost a lot of the big, big trees that, that were like landmarks around. Uh, um, let's see, what is it? Tour um, Park? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tour Park, we lost a lot of trees up in that way. So it changed the, the way the city looked mm -hmm. a lot by, because we lost a lot of the big old trees, and we lost the, um, the stone walls, and we lost uh, the, some of the wharfs, I guess, you know, the. Mm -hmm piers that went out like that and they had to be placed down. Mm -hmm. that, was a, that was a change in the city. Is there a uh, particularly dramatic or unusual story about the hurricane that you remember hearing from other people or friends? Mm -hmm. I, still have, I think I have some pictures of that hurricane that were taken of the city during it. Then they're in a scrapbook at the Miller Palace. We did take pictures, we did cut out pictures that were in the Daily News uh, from that hurricane. But I don't remember any really dramatic story. I don't remember anybody getting hurt or killed or anything like that. Do you remember much about the rebuilding after that hurricane? You were rather young, I uh, No, I don't remember any rebuilding going on, not until. World War II and the torpedo station. Uh, <clears throat> do you recall much about how Newport uh, was affected by uh, World War II and the navies coming in at the early stages of World War II? I think the people in Newport were a little leery of, of um, the navy when they came here. We weren't, uh, we were told that we were not allowed to talk to sailors, Navy men, you know, we weren't allowed to go any of the places that they thought these Navy people would go. Uh, all of the trouble in the streets, uh, anything that ever happened was always blamed on the Navy once they got here. No matter who did it, it was Navy. If you picked up the paper and read where somebody had vandalized uh, a car or a house, uh, you automatically say there must have been a Navy because things like that just didn't happen before they got here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, or so we thought, you know. Uh, naturally, after I got old, I could, I realized that we couldn't blame everything that happened in the city on the Navy. Um, they, they did. There was no, um, nothing for them to do. No, no places for them to go except the YMCA. And, I noticed after a while the people began to uh, build things to to give them some place to go, uh, you know, um, a Christian reading room where they could go and read uh, and study their Bibles and things like that. A USO uh, on West Broadway, uh, skating rink, you know, things, and they started. Uh, picking up the activities so that the guys would have something to go. I think they realized that a lot of them that came here were very young. Mm -hmm. And uh, although they had on uniforms, they were still just kids. Mm -hmm. Was your family life disrupted uh, by the war, as you recall? When it came to my brother going into service. I had an older brother that went into service. That, that bothered um, my mother and my father, the fact that he had to go out, go into service. Um, at that same time, I think he had only been in the service a year or so before. Let's see, seven, eight, nine, two years, I think. Oh no, just about a year he was in the Navy when my other brother was killed. Mm -hmm. And um, there was no one here but me. My mother was in New York. My father was driving long distance, you know, taking the delivery to Alexandria, Virginia. My brother was in the Navy in California. 
and I was here with my aunt when that happened. And uh, what we noticed was that not only because it was around the holidays, but because of the servicemen traveling back and forth, it was difficult for them to get home. Uh, all of them, I think my mother stood up all the way from New York here when she finally did get on the train. Um, the city was crowded. It seemed like it was hustle bustle all the time, day and night, every day uh, during the war. Uh, there were just, uh, I guess, a lot of people. That's what it, that's what I remember mostly. That the town seemed like it was just filled with people mm. all the time. Mm. Winter as well as summer. Winter as well as summer. Yeah. Uh, do you recall the rationing system during that time, how it worked? Very faintly. I remember having, we used to have books of rationing stamps for sugar. Uh, I know sugar was rationed. Uh, I'm not sure about anything else, but I do remember having books of rationing stamps you know, that we had to take to the store. Was there anyone that uh, you or your family knew that were like in the uh, coastal artillery here at uh, Fort Adams or, or in the National Guard? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did anyone that you uh, you knew at that time leave their jobs for for the higher paying war related jobs? I, I like think just about to... everybody that worked as a domestic <laughs> left left that service uh -huh. and went to the torpedo station. Mm -hmm. You know, anybody that had a job because. Um, they were paying, I guess, at that time, what we called good money, you know, more than you'd make as a domestic, and everybody wanted to uh, to get up on their feet, and that was their opportunity. And it was also taking just about anybody could work there. You didn't have to have a skill. They would train you, so mm -hmm. everybody went over there. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that had an effect on the domestic trade. I'm sure it did. Um, I'm sure it did. I'm, I'm sure that they didn't have that many some of people coming back here during the war because they probably couldn't get the help that they had, you know. Mm -hmm. And then some people came here and brought their own people with them who worked for them in other places oh, and brought their right. own domestics with them. Mm -hmm. And that still goes on. Mm -hmm. That still goes on here. There are people, there are, I know of two women that come here every summer and they work for the family someplace else in the winter months, but when the family comes here for the summer, they come with them. Mm -hmm. Did the uh, concentration of Navy preparations and, and like defense stuff at the torpedo station uh, give people a, a sense of security at that time, do you recall, or kind of the opposite of fear? I think it gave them a sense of financial security. You know, I think they felt uh, that they were uh, at last getting on their feet. You know, at last I can, I can go to the store and buy, you know, groceries enough to last a couple of days rather than from day to day mm -hmm. or rather than run a bill with a grocery they could uh, you know take twenty dollars and buy some groceries mm -hmm. um, they were able to buy clothes I know I saw a difference in the way we lived in the way we ate you know we were at, at, at then at least we could have you know meet once a week on uh, a big Sunday dinner Mm -hmm. you know, whereas before, you know, it, it, during the week it's just whatever you can get, a sandwich here or there, you know, a bowl of cereal or what have you. And uh, on Sunday it was a, a decent dinner. Mm -hmm. My mother began to buy clothes and I can remember she would stop in the store on her way home sometimes on payday and, and buy me a pair of shorts and a blouse and things like that. We never got that before. Mm -hmm. okay. Was there... Uh, Feeling a fear in the community, but the, here, here's Newport now, a perhaps a uh, target for the enemy with all of our torpedo stations. And well, there was some talk about that if they, if uh, the Germans came here or, or the Japanese came here, that the first place they would bomb would be the torpedo station or the naval base over here. And I don't think the people really realized that there was any danger. I don't think people really thought about it that much. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that um, if they had been, if the fighting had started in this country, I think people may have been, had that fear, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. 
I believe you said last time that uh, you or, or some of your family were involved in volunteer work during that time. I did a lot of, I wrote letters. That was what I, I liked to do. Writing letters was a hobby of mine. Mm -hmm. And I had 25 servicemen in Newport mm -hmm. that I wrote to weekly. And I sent them all newspapers. Uh, clipping, either I would buy the daily news and clip things out that I thought they'd be interested in and send it to them. And then we wrote a little newspaper, a weekly paper, uh, Teenage Canteen at the Recreational Center. And we wrote a little newspaper. And we'd send them newspapers like that. And uh, I would collect their dog tags, you know, mm -hmm. the, and, and the guys would say, each one would send me one of their dog tags. You know? mm -hmm. And I had a, a little box that I kept my souvenirs and things in. And we had a mailman at the time called Dan, and Dan used to whistle through his teeth. And I knew when he was coming, because he'd start at the corner and he'd whistle through his teeth and call me by name, Gertrude, and he'd start whistling. And he'd come and I'd have a stack of mail like this. He says, I don't see anybody in Newport get mail like you. I, I don't think a day went by that I didn't get seven, eight, ten letters a day, you know, for, and the guys would all answer my letters. When they came back, they, those letters meant a lot to them while they were overseas. Mm -hmm. okay. So that was the only volunteer work that I did then as a, as a child. Um, How did you get these fellows' names? Most of them were Newport. They were all Newporters. Oh, were they? Yeah, they were Newporters. And at those, my, my brother was over there, and I wrote to him, and he may have said, you know, had a picture of me, and the guy said, well, who's this? That's my sister. And he said, can I write to her? And he said, well, I'll ask her, you know. So she writes to a lot of fellas. And they'd give my, my friend would ask me, and I'd say, sure, I'll write to him. And I, I'd meet people like that, you know. I've had a couple of them come back to Newport just to meet me. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I, I just like to write letters. I don't now, but I did then. <laughs> I used to love to write letters. You do that throughout the war? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. The uh, canteen, which you, the teenage canteen, mm -hmm. which you mentioned, was that an organization set up during the war? That was, yeah, that was, set, it wasn't just because of the war, it was part of our recreational center. And it was a place for us to go in the evening hours to stay out of the street. And it was held in the community center, the rec. Uh -huh. And uh, we went there like two or three nights a week. And it was just a place for us to go and talk and dance and, you know, play records. And we had a couple of fellows that played instruments. And sometimes we'd get them together and they'd play for us. Or else we'd go down and watch a basketball game and then go in there and dance, you know, and just, just talk. You know. But we put out that newsletter and uh, I would tell them, you know, the different people that I was hearing from, what, what they were doing, where they were. Just some place to go to keep from being in the streets. Do you recall if uh, your neighborhood was in any way particularly affected by the increased number of uh, servicemen? You briefly touched on the fact that there was some thought among the neighborhood that maybe mm -hmm. uh, some crime was being committed. But remember in, in any other ways that the servicemen might have affected the neighborhood? It didn't seem to me at that time that many people bought their their wives and families with them at that time, at least not those that we came in contact with. They were more or less just young boys. And um, they didn't seem to bring any families with them. Um, was there increased usage of uh, the notorious district that you mentioned on West Broadway at mm -hmm. that time? Increased traffic there of people? I guess there was, but we weren't allowed to walk down there. <laughs> we don't walk down West Broadway. In order to, for, for us to get to the wreck, we had to go down Broadway. Oh, but I would imagine that there was a lot of traffic through there. But because all of the clubs sat there, yeah. too. Mm -hmm. You know, the bars. So. But you didn't notice any overflow into the neighborhood from that uh, of noise or violence or anything? They was, you know, like they would. They were young boys, they would run through the neighborhood and, and do the same thing that our hometown boys would do, you know, start a lot of noise, knocking down garbage cans, ringing doorbells, and, you know, sometimes just walking through the streets, you know, just looking, you know. And they are not saying what they're looking for, but they would just be walking through the streets. You know. The torpedo station, uh, who worked there? Your mother? 
My mother and my father both. And your father, and your father would, he, he drove trucks that was yes. for the torpedoes, for the Navy? Yes. Mm -hmm. I see. Hauling and materials? Um, mostly to torpedoes. torpedoes. Mm -hmm. Oh, he would haul the torpedoes. That mm -hmm. sounds like dangerous driving. Yes, it was. Oh. Very dangerous. Wow. Yeah. I can remember him coming home. I have, um, well, at a, at, sometimes I have premonitions, I guess that's what it is. And I woke up one morning. And I kept telling my mother, I said, something's wrong. She said, what's that? I kept crying. She said, what's that? I said, something's wrong. And I don't know what it is. And she said, I don't like to hear you say that because whenever you say that, something happens. And when my father got home, he was about, I guess, about 10 hours late. We found out that he was coming down a hill and it was snowing and icy and the trailer jackknifed. And he had a load of torpedoes on it. And he was able to hold it till he got to the bottom of the hill and straighten it out. But the trailer had jacked up and he came down the hill sideways. And I guess that's what was bothering me. I knew in my heart and in my mind there was something wrong there. But I didn't know what it was. He's had a couple, he had a couple of narrow escapes. Mm -hmm. truck, driving in icy weather. Your father and your mom worked there. Yeah. What did she do there? I don't remember what she did. I, I don't imagine it was anything. I guess probably it was like a, an assembly line. You, know, like, yeah. you recall what she thought about her job there? Did she talk much about it? No, I think most of them never thought any more than the fact that they were making at least a decent wage. I think that was everybody's major When you, you know, when you go without for so long and uh, you, you worry about where your next meal is coming from, how you're going to feed your children, how you're going to dress your children. When you find a job that's going to pay you a decent salary, I think that that's about all you think about. You know, whether you like the type of work you're doing or not, that's not important. The only important thing is that you're making a decent salary and you're going to be able to support your family. Mm -hmm. Do you have a uh, most vivid memory of uh, victory in Europe Day or victory in Japan or the end of the war? VJ Day, <laughs> yeah. Everybody in the streets screaming and yelling and, and really happy that the war was over and that we won and that all the boys would be coming home. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just remember anywhere you went, people were holding up two fingers of D for victory. <laughs> um, just just really happy dancing and, and hollering and screaming and crying and everything in the streets. That's, that's what I remember mostly that night. Uh, it just seemed like everything was open. Uh, people were all over the streets. The, you know, um, USO was filled with people. And everybody was just having a good time, so happy it was over. Mm -hmm. The jazz festivals in Newport, uh, your dad played jazz, but uh, you said he got to know a lot of people. He got, yes, he played jazz when he had a couple of bands of his own, and uh, he also worked with some of the bands out of New York City. Um, hmm. that, um, that was a difficult time, too, because he was away from home a lot. Um, most of the gigs were on weekends, and that was the time that he would was um, away. He would work at the torpedo station and then, you know, get off Friday night and go to New York and 
work fr- uh, you know, Friday night and Saturday night and, you know, come back home Sunday. Mm-hmm. You mentioned you knew some of the famous people. Yeah, um, my aunt li- lived in a house on St. Nicholas uh, Avenue and in the same house uh, Johnny Hodges lived and that's where my father met him. But he also played with him in a band. He played with Chip Webb. He played with Billy Holiday. Mm-hmm. Chip Webb was a piano player for Billy Holiday. Mm-hmm. Um, he came back to Newport and when he started his own little band, he had a, a little three-piece band at one time. And I think he played right up until the last 10 years of his life at different places. Um, when the jazz festivals came here, uh, when they first started, uh, it was just a jazz festival. Then it had a jazz festival, one week jazz festival, one week blues festival. And uh, a lot of the stars came here. He knew. He brought Joe Williams home one night uh, for the mm-hmm. festival. Um, a lot of the uh, guys that played sax, the same as he did, he brought home. Um, I worked for George Mee during part of the uh, jazz festival time. And uh, we were always given uh, free tickets to the afternoon concerts and you know, all the Sunday concerts. And we worked seven days a week for him. And that was, uh, it, was it was a tough job, but we got to meet a lot of people. Uh, met George's wife. We had, they gave us a party after every festival. They'd give all the people that worked for them a big party at his house. Mm-hmm. They were nice people to work for. I think the jazz festival really lit up this city, and I think that's what put Newport on the map. People never thought of Newport, even though the sailors were here during the war. Mm-hmm. People, a lot of people never heard about Newport, unless they had some contact with the very rich. They never thought, never heard of Newport. Mm-hmm. When we went to Virginia, nobody ever knew it. When I said Newport, they say Newport, Kentucky, Newport, Maine. You know, <laughs> you know, where is Newport? And uh, I'd say Rhode Island. Don't you know the six New England states? No, you know, never heard of Rhode Island. You know, <laughs> but I think the jazz festival put Newport on the map because every time, you know, after the festival started being here, when we would be traveling, people would see Rhode Island tags and they say. Are you from Newport? And said, yeah, you've been up there for the festivals? Uh, we had, one year we came home from Virginia, we had about six cars trailing us. They wanted to come right into Newport and they didn't know how to get here. And they said, are you going to Newport? And we said, yes, we're going home for a couple of weeks. And they said, can we follow you? And we said, yeah. So when we came off the ferry, it used to be a ferry that ran from um, Norfolk to Ocean, I think it's Ocean View. And, um, when we came off the ferry, they came out behind us and they followed us all the way into Newport. But like I said, nobody knew about Newport unless you had a lot of money, you know, on the yacht or something around the, the drive, you know. There were some riots associated with some of the festivals, wasn't Yes. Um, you remember much about those? I remember the first one that we had I didn't, I went to the festival that night, but we could not get in. And so we came back and stopped in one of the clubs. And I remember the policeman coming in and saying the club had to close, take everything off the table, no no drinks on the table, close the clubs up, and we asked what was wrong, and they said it was a riot. And that was one of the festivals of the Fruity Park. That was the first one. And I think that was the night that, uh, Ray Charles was on. Sorry, do you remember the year of that? I can't recall that year. Let me see, I was here, that was here, I was here from Virginia. So it had to be between 58 and 61. It had to be between them because I was here on vacation. Okay, the last one I think was in 74. Hmm. Was that 73 or 74? And that was right down here. See, we're sitting up on the hill now. Well, when you walk out the store here, when you go to the left, you look right straight down. It's a 
big field there. That was where the stage was built. Oh, and um, they had a big festival. That night I was sitting seven rows from the front for the fe for the jam session and Dionne Wallach was on the stage. And they had a like a what they call a snow fence across here. These houses were in here. And they had a snow fence there. And I think they had turned down some people who couldn't get in. Probably some of them didn't even try. But they started coming over the fence. And I happened to turn sideways and look and I said, Oh, oh no. And the fellow that I was with said, It's go we're gonna be in trouble. He said, Come on, just get up walk very calmly and let's get out of here. And by the time we started up, everybody else started getting up and trying to get out. And bottles were flying and rocks were flying, you know, and uh, hmm. they started running up on the stage, you know. And George Weiner was trying to keep things going, you know, trying to find Dionne Wallach was crying. And, uh, she was really upset, you know. Um, we managed to get out to the street over there by uh, J.C. Penney's. We managed to get out in that part of the street and uh, they had set off like tear gas. And our car was parked up by gate two. So we just went across the railroad tracks and climbed that incline and got to the car rather than try to walk around like, like we got in there. Um, I'm not surprised that there was a riot because when we came there, there were people on the streets that were smoking dope and selling pills. You could buy anything you wanted to right out there on the street. I'm not surprised. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess the police didn't know how to handle it. I think they felt like if they tried to arrest all these people, it would cause, you know, um, mass confusion. And so they let it go. And it was just as bad. Yeah. It was just as bad. But I mean, you couldn't walk down the street if somebody wasn't stopping you and opening a box and then have all these different color pills, you know. You could afford anything you wanted. I mm -hmm. think that that was a problem. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the festivals uh, concerning these riots uh, should have been, should have been continued when they were in the or something? I think they should have. I think I have my own ideas of why uh, they didn't continue the festivals, but I have my own idea, you know, about the fact that there was trouble every year. You were getting a license, or the hours, or the days of the week, or the times, or something. George Wayne, uh, they just gave him a hard time every year, every single year that he came in. I'm surprised he stayed as long as he did you know, with the hassle that, that the city gave them. Um, also, when they decided that they weren't going to have the festival here, people made such a hullabaloo about it that they made they put it on a referendum. And the people in the city of Newport voted to keep the festivals here. Okay? Now, they had that riot, and granted it, you know, it was, I don't think anybody was really hurt that badly or anything. But the fact that it disturbed the city, uh, they cut it out. They canceled the rest of the festival for that week and just said they would not have it here any longer. To me, that's telling me that my vote does not count. Or you just canceled out my vote. I voted, yes, I wanted the festivals here. There was a disturbance and you said, no, no more festivals. That canceled my vote out. That makes me think that I don't have anything to say about what goes on in the city that I pay taxes in. And I resent that. And I think a lot of people in Newport did, because they wanted it here. It, brought a, it didn't bring a lot of revenue to, to us, the everyday people, except for us who work, you know, those of us who may have worked for the festivals. You see, we, we worked as chambermaids, and they rented all of the um, houses that belonged to um, Bernard, which used to be Bernard Court Junior College in South Virginia, probably had houses around there. And they would rent them and set the, the um, entertainers up in these houses. And so we worked for them, keeping their rooms clean and making up beds and setting the houses up before the festival and then cleaning up afterwards. You know? And so we made money there. 
I'm sure the shopkeepers made money, um, and the stores, and people who had rooms to rent made uh, money. Uh, of course, there were a lot of people who came into the city that didn't have any money to spend, that, you know, maybe rode bicycles across country, um, hitchhiked, walked, whatever, and got here for that festival. And I'm sure that there were a lot of people that um, nobody wanted to have anything to do with that didn't bring any money into the city, you know, um, didn't bring much goodwill either. <laughs> but um, I still think that it added, the festivals themselves added a lot to the city. I really do. And I'd like to see them back here. I really would. Um, I know that uh, they don't have the I don't think they have a place here now large enough to handle the number of people that used to come to the festivals. Mm -hmm. I don't think they have the space. Mm -hmm. Because the island has gotten more dense with it's more densely populated. It's um well, like this place here was all woods out mm -hmm. here. Okay. And they built it up. Um, they they've been having um the last two festivals they had were they only allow so many people in and they were held over at Port Adams. I'm right. sure that um, they could never accommodate the number of people that came into the city. The departure of the Navy fleet. Do you feel it was a gain or a loss for the Navy? I'm sorry. For the, for the, for the city? I think it was a loss for the Navy. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, once they once they pulled out, we um, it was a lot of fear among the people here that you know jobs were going to be lost and um, money was going to be lost to uh, to uh, rents and to shopkeepers and uh, things like that. Um, It wasn't as bad as we thought. We it didn't take us long to recover from that pullout. Um, I was sorry to see the Navy go, but I was also uh, a little angry with the way they treated the Navy while the Navy was here, and I felt like they may have been justified in pulling out. Um, what I discovered by my my husband was in the Navy. And I know that when you went to rent an apartment, and if you, they found out you were Navy, the rent automatically went up. Uh, you also had to come up with, you know, an extra month's rent because you were Navy and, you know, there were always these little clauses in here, but you don't get this back if you don't give me 30 days notice or if you don't give me so many weeks notice because they felt like the Navy could pull you up today and move you right out without any notice. You know? um, I did not like the way they blamed everything that happened in the city that was bad. It was the Navy's fault. And I, I guess as a kid when they were saying things like that it didn't really touch me because I wasn't married at the time but after I married a Navy man and I knew what, you know, what we were going through. Uh, I could relate to the rest of the, the Navy, you know, and I didn't blame them for being treated, uh, for, for wanting to leave. If that, was, if that had anything to do with it, I don't know. Mm -hmm. We often talk about the reason the Navy did pull out. Mm -hmm. Nobody really knows, I don't think. They ever told us why they pulled out of here. In what ways did you see the city change after the pullout? Well, uh, one of the things I noticed is that uh, there weren't that many uh, activities in, you know, USOs and YMCAs and uh, things like that sort of died down. Transportation, the bus schedules, you know, like the transportation in and out of the city, we lost bus buses. Um, we cut out some of the runs to Providence. We cut out some of the flights out of here because they didn't think they'd have enough um, people using those things. 
I guess just the, a lot of the activity in the, in the uh, entertainment world, you know, like the clubs and things like that, I think that sort of quieted down. So. How did the pull-out seem to affect you in the Transportation? Transportation. We didn't see too much... Um, Happy man, we didn't have too many Navy people living there unless they married Newport girls. Most of them lived in Navy Islands. I think in other areas they may have missed uh, the Navy because of that. You know, they were they had to then stop and we rent apartments and rooms and things like that. Find people uh, other than Navy personnel to rent these rooms for. I didn't see much effect in our neighborhood because we didn't see that many Navy people through there. Now, were you still in the West Broadway area? Yeah, the West Broadway area. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I, I didn't move out of that area until uh, 74, 75. So the nature of the housing didn't change that much in the neighborhood because there were not that many Navy people. Most of the fellas that I knew that lived in that neighborhood had bought their homes, so they stayed. Those that were here, you know, just for duty. Did how did the Navy pull out something to affect you first, or did it? It didn't affect me at all. Yeah. I'd say, um, there was no difference in my life um, when they left in seventy. Was it seventy three? Yeah, at that time my husband and I were divorced, but he was out of the Navy anyway, and uh, he stayed right there in the Navy, but I stayed there uh, until, seven, like I said, 74, 75, and then I moved out here. It didn't affect me at all. I noticed, uh, I just noticed a lot of empty houses, but they were all out of this area, you know, not in that West Coast. Did the city seem to be caught by surprise? Yes. I'm very, they're quite upset. Mm. Quite upset about it. And angry. Uh, angry, yes. Very angry. But like I say, I think sometimes that the Navy was justified uh, in pulling out after the way the city treated them. Mm. Were there any government agencies uh, that were here to help out and seemed to try to get people to adapt? I don't know of any government agency. No. Why do you think so many Navy people have chosen to retire here? Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is about me, but it sort of grows on people. Uh, because when they first come here, they don't like it. I think it's because of the lack of um, entertainment and things to do. Uh, people don't like it. But I think that once they um, have been here for a while and gotten to know the city and the people in it, um, it's a nice place to retire anyway. I, I wouldn't even encourage really young people to sell it. I don't encourage my own children to come back here. Um, I don't think there's enough here for any young person who wants to grow and to prosper. For people who want to retire, um, try to get for other people. I wouldn't suggest that. That's a terrible thing to say about your own city. But uh, I like it here. I like it, but I am ready to retire. You know, so it's fine for me. But my children are ambitious and they want to grow and prosper. And I don't think that they could do it here. Describe a Friday or Saturday night uh, on Thames Street when the fleet was here. <laughs> that I cannot do because I never went down there. Um, what I have heard is that, it, uh, well, I know that during the day there are a lot of night spots, like every other corner, mm -hmm. some kind of a little club or barroom or dinky joint as I call them and uh, 
I would imagine the streets were filled or like they are any summer, any tourist season on Bay Street uh, at that time. You know, they had a lot of little uh, jazz clubs and you know rock and roll clubs and things like that down there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At that time too, I guess the things were so more crowded than now before the redevelopment. Yeah, when during that time they had. Um, on the right hand side of the street going down a place called the Blue Moon Garden. And I think that was right there where Lee's Century Store is somewhere around in that area. And they had the Hunt Club and they had all kinds of clubs down in that area. And from what I understand that the that uh, other, the first club I told you about is um they had exotic dances in there. So that stayed for the sailors. The Hunt Club was a jazz club, so that stayed full of people. Um, I think more of an older crowd, because most young people don't like jazz. Most young people like rock and roll and things like that. So um, once, when they brought in somebody like, um, uh, let's say Sarah Holmes, I can't even think of her name. I just played an album by her. I can't remember her name. Uh, they brought her here. I went to the hunt club to hear her one night, one Sunday. And that's about the only time that I've been on Dame Street during that time. Mm -hmm. I don't care that much about crowds. Uh, they make me nervous. <laughs> Especially noisy <laughs> yeah. uh, A little bit on the Newport Bridge and ferry and the change of the ferry system. Uh, how often did you take the ferry from Newport? We used to. That was um, part of our entertainment. Like on a Sunday afternoon, we would ride the ferry from Newport to Jamestown and back again. Mm -hmm. You could pay, I think, what, 20 cents and get on the ferry and just ride back and forth, back and forth. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it, it, we would get on and walk to the end so that we could watch the Jamestown side until we got there, you know, and then when it turned around, we could go back to the other end and watch the Newport side, and that was part of our entertainment. That was something to do on a Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We were hoping that when they built the bridge that they would uh, keep the ferry, too, you know, mm -hmm. but they decided to get It was slow, and it would break down, but... Uh, it, it's just a part of Newport, and without it, it just doesn't seem right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did the, the following up on that not quite seem right? Did the, the, the bridge uh, from Jamestown to Newport seem to change the city in, in some ways? I kind of think it it probably brought more tourists into the city. I think it was easier, easier access to the city. More expensive, but easier. You know, uh, like the, the cars, I don't know how much they charge the cars on the ferry, but I'm sure it wasn't $2 to come over and $2 come back like it is for that bridge. <laughs> yeah. so, I think that, but I think that we have a lot more people coming in now into the city during the tourist season. Because of that bridge, it's easier to get here. Um, and it's quicker rather than go through the Mount Hope Bridge and have to go through all those little towns. You know, they can come over this way. Mm -hmm. About your riding the ferry for uh, entertainment, mm -hmm. um, was that when you were young? Really, see, really young. Yeah, uh -huh. really young. Uh, we were 12, 13, 14 years old. Mm -hmm. The ferry was there up until the, uh, uh, were there 60s? Oh yeah, let me see. The, it was there until the bridge was built. Sixty nine. The oh, bridge yeah. finished around seventy six. When did I come? I'm terrible with years. I'm terrible with years. It's been ten years. Sure. Mm. Probably has been about ten years. 
the ferry was there right up until then. You used it for more utilitarian purposes, I guess, in the 60s and 50s? Um, the only reason I used the ferry was just for the ride. You know, okay. um, I think they kind of used that ferry for the torpedo station. Maybe they had a ferry, I think, that took people to the torpedo station. I don't know whether it was the same one or not, but that's what they used. Did you uh, use a particular one yourself when you go for rides? Or was no, we, we used, I can't even think of the name of it now. There were two, but we would just ride it for the fun of it. It didn't cost that much, and we would just, that was something that we could do that didn't cost a lot of money, that kept us out of the streets, mm -hmm. and kept us out of trouble. You and your friends were there? Yes. Yeah. Girl. group of girls and boys. Mm -hmm. And stay on there for, for Stay on there for a while, was, you know, just riding back and forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were, there, uh, were there lunch counters on the ferry? Mm -hmm. I don't recall. I don't recall. I know they have cars. They got cars over there. I don't think we ever bought anything. Mm -hmm. Well, at that time, we didn't have any money for lunch counters or anything else. You know, it was, like I said, ch uh, some cheap and uh, cheap way to entertain ourselves and, um, and, a, and a way of keeping us out of trouble. You know, I don't think it cost me 10 cents, 20 cents to ride the ferry, something like that. But we didn't have money at that time to do anything else. And I think that it was good because um, because we didn't have money, we could do something constructive like ride the ferry, rather than stand on street corners and you know get into a lot of trouble. Um, if we had a lot more things like well, even if the young people today were interested in those kind of things, I think we'd have less problems with them. But they're not interested in those things. <laughs> they they want to do something with a lot more action than ride a ferry. <laughs> We're just about out, Miss Henry. I think we'll save this last section for uh, next visit. Okay. Is that okay? Okay, okay Miss Henry. Uh, on restoration, uh, could you give me a, uh, a general view of how you see restoration in, in your neighborhood? In, uh, Broadway, how you saw it happen and what your feeling is about it. Well, I, I think I first noticed a change about uh, in the past 15 years. Uh, there's been quite a change. The, um, no more burnout buildings, no more empty buildings. They were beginning to uh, tear down the uh, burnt out buildings you know prior to that time there were a lot of uh, buildings that had been you know empty because of fire or for some other reason and they just stood there you know they were just a blight there and they were a danger to the children that played in the area because they would go in you know and ceilings would fall the windows were out and things like that then uh, they started tearing these buildings down and those that were good and sturdy you know uh, foundations uh, they started rehabilitating those houses you know. um, we noticed a lot of people moving out of the community a lot of community people moving out and then moving back in once the houses were restored mm -hmm. and new families coming in mm -hmm. in the past I'll say seven eight nine years when we had the community development program really starting, we noticed that the Church Community Corporation was buying up houses and restoring them. And it's made a great difference in the neighborhood. I mean, it does, it no longer looks like uh, the area when, uh, when you know, when we had all the uh, tenements and mm -hmm. the housing project, um, buildings all empty and, and half standing and things like that. 
It's beginning to go back now to what it was when I was a kid when all of the houses were occupied mm -hmm. and there were a lot of families in there. Mm -hmm. So it's beginning to go back to that now and I think it's a good idea. I think it looks really nice. I'm very proud of it. You, know? you mentioned the Church Community Corporation? Yes, what is that, that? It's, a, it's a non-profit agency that was founded by a cousin of mine, uh, Herschel Carter. And, um, what they wanted to do is a group of community people who uh, wanted to restore houses and to keep people who lived in that community in that community, you know. At one time we had a lot of what we call absentee landlords. These are people that owned the buildings in that area but lived in Middletown and Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. And they really didn't care whether the houses were rat infested or roach infested or whether people had you know, running water, um, mm -hmm. bathing facilities or anything. They didn't care about that. And consequently, when the houses got really bad, you know, and then the people had to move out, those houses just sat there. The Church Community Corporation formed, and they bought up some of these houses and restored them. And then they built brand new ones on lots that um, poor people could buy. You know, because at that time it was very difficult to even get a mortgage from a bank for, to buy property in that area. Mm -hmm. okay, unless you were um, retired from the service or unless you went to Fall River to a bank, you couldn't get money to buy houses in that area. Church Community Corporation came along and they made it possible for poor people to buy their own homes. And there are houses, in our own. they got lots of houses there now. I think they were selling something for like twenty-three thousand dollars, but the mortgage payments were based on the income, and uh, you know, they helped. That really helped fix up the neighborhood, you know, by building those houses. And that was starting about when? Oh, that started. I'd say about ten years ago. I know quite a few people that have houses built by the Church Community Corporation, mm -hmm. and uh, they're still in the. They're, they're all shaped alike. Uh, they're mostly three bedroom houses, plenty of land around them. Uh, with the, the shape like the typical Newport, New England style houses. Uh, and, uh, they, they really help make the neighborhood uh, look nice. And then they started the, the, the project down here. They tore down some garages and some old houses and things like that and put the new project in there. Um, another change I've seen is when I was a child, we all had houses but little alleyways beside them and now people have opened up those spaces and they have driveways mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, larger backyards and things like that. You know. So you can see that people have prospered over the years because uh, I guess when we were kids we didn't have cars so we really didn't need our street parking you know mm -hmm. but now people have off street parking houses look better uh, people have painted their houses and um, put new storm windows on and things like that and they were able to do this through community development through the church community corporation all of these agencies that helped them you know get grants and things that's probably been one way, I guess, to fight the displacement that sometimes went on when people uh, had their houses bought out from under them if they were renting. Yeah, that that was true. Uh, um, a great deal in, in that community. Uh, was there a lot of displacement? There? there was a lot of displacement because when the houses caught fire or when we had absentee landlords and the houses just were not fit to live in, people left and moved out to Tommy Hill Park Home. Chapel Terrace and low income housing project. And that was the idea of the Church Community Corporation and the new project was to bring the people back into that neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, people that really wanted to stay there. And it seemed to work that way. It noticed. did, yeah. Mm -hmm. I see, uh, this past year I see a lot of people coming back into the neighborhood mm -hmm. to that housing project. Did you? And uh, no very many people, or relatives or friends that were displaced uh, initially? Well, I, I knew a lot of people. They weren't relatives or, you know, but people that I knew that had to move out of that community. You know, and, um, 
now some of them are coming back, some of those that are able to get into that housing project. Some of those that were able to buy homes uh, after a while went back there and bought homes. Did you ever go to any of the city council meetings or planning board uh, meetings uh, when the, uh, these projects were discussed? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Yeah, I'm sure there was quite a controversy because I think we, most of us were afraid that once the houses were torn down and rebuilt that we would not be able to come back into that neighborhood, that the rents would be so high mm -hmm. uh, nobody would be able to afford them. You know? I think that was a problem when we first started um, with, uh, it was called redevelopment then. And I think that was the idea that everybody was afraid that if we let re redevelopment come into that area, that all of us would be moved out of that area and would never have the opportunity to get back in because they would build houses and the rents would be so enormous that we wouldn't be able to, to uh, afford it. So we fought redevelopment for some time, okay? It lay dead for a few years and then they came back with community development. And in this community development uh, project, we were able to get grants and loans to fix up the houses that we owned and, um, and stay there, you know, rather than, than just take the houses and move us out completely. So uh, people kind of went along with the community development, mm -hmm. uh, more so than redevelopment. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it all boils down to the same thing. Uh, redevelopment and community, community development, I think it's all the same thing. We always thought that it was a ploy for the city to kind of get that neighborhood to be in control of that neighborhood so that, you know, it, they could put all of the um, shopping centers and, and the big stores and things in that area because, as I said before, that's the center of town. And from that point, you can walk just about anywhere you want to go in Newport during storms when there's hurricanes and, and high waters, that's a part of the town that does not flood. So everybody wanted that that part of town, you mm -hmm. know. And I think that they had in mind to move all of the minorities and and low income people out of that area, you know, into the low income projects and then just take over that part of the city. But we fought it as hard as we could. Well, it didn't and, happen. and it didn't happen. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, because I think it's a nice area, and I like the area myself, um, and a lot of people do. But there's been a lot of change there. It's uh, when you rise through the streets now, it's amazing that uh, the changes that have taken place. You know, the structures. And, yes. Um, yes. I've only been here about a year and a half, but uh, uh, I've seen a tremendous change down in that uh, West Broadway area in the oh, last yeah. year. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, in the last year, was that more of a change than its experience over the last few years? Or was that yes, kind of that, was, that was like a great change in the past year because Community Baptist Church went up and then the housing project went up and uh, the Paramount Building, you know, was done mm -hmm. over. And I think it raised the consciousness of a lot of people who owned homes in that area, they began to paint and fix up their own homes, you know. It's like, well, this one here next door to me looks so nice, and that one on the other side of me looks like I've got to do something to mine. Uh -huh. And I think it just raised the consciousness of the people that lived in that area. And it's, it's really beginning to take shape now. You noticed that in some of them. Oh, the yes, it definitely, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh. A little bit about America's Cup. Uh, <clears throat> what is your earliest recollection of the America's Cup series? I know you were kind of involved in the perimeter, as you said, but what do you remember about the series? And your earliest memories? Oh, I, I, the, the thing I remember most is that the town at that time, when the America's Cup Saturday place began to fill up with people, mm -hmm. and the town just seems like it's more alive that there's just a lot of things going on and I think that the you know the number of people coming into the city uh, I didn't 
really pay that much attention to the America's Cup. I think my closest um, contact with that was this past year when I had some some tenants that were with France too that rented the apartments that I had. And that was the closest contact with them. Um, I really didn't pay that much attention to them because you can't miss all of it because you have to watch it on the news on TV and in the newspapers, you know. Yeah, but I didn't pay that much attention to what went on in that part of town. Mm -hmm. So you were not directly involved in that company? No. Not like you were with the, with the jazz festival? Oh, no, not like that. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> what, in your opinion, is uh, America's Cup's uh, main contribution? Was it? to Newport? I really don't, th I don't know what they contributed to Newport except that they may have helped the the shopkeepers and the innkeepers, you know, in that area and the rest of the restaurants and things in that area. Um, they brought, I'm sure that it helped bring in a lot more tourists because people came here to see the America's Cup. Um, people from, from foreign countries, you know, a lot more people in the city. Like I said, the city just seems alive when something like that is going on. Mm -hmm. you know, um, it's kind of frustrating for those of us who live here all the time and want to go out to dinner or want to shop in that area. There's no parking facilities, mm -hmm. and, you know, and it's hard to get around. But uh, I like the hustle bustle of the city when it's, mm -hmm. when it's going on. Mm -hmm. The effect of America's Cup uh, on your neighborhood was pretty minimal, then, as you, yes, as you yes, saw it. Very minimal. I, I didn't see any uh, no, direct, no effect. direct effect at all. Mm -hmm. I, I think this past year, since um, they've been fixing up the West Broadway area, we did see a lot of people coming in to rent rooms and apartments that hmm. ordinarily would not be in that area. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, like I said, when I was a kid, um, it was a really mixed neighborhood. And then it began to go predominantly black. And now it's beginning to be mixed again. And so you're getting Navy personnel, and you're getting tourists, and you're getting people who come here, uh, you know, for summer vacations, all getting into that neighborhood. You know? mm -hmm. People in all income brackets are going into that neighborhood. So I, that was the, that's the only effect that I can see that the America's Cup had in there. We see a lot of those people that are coming in there and renting rooms or, or getting hmm. apartments during that time. Uh, I think you mentioned it. The question here is how do you feel? How do you feel about uh, living in a city where events such as this take place? I mentioned a very positive. Um, that, uh, yeah. The city seemed to lie. The city, it does, because Newport, um, well, it's, it's a summer place, really. And during the winter months, it just seemed like they roll up the sidewalks at 9 o'clock. There's <laughs> not much happening. But in the summertime, it's, it's, the city is really alive with people. And a lot of things going on, places to go, things to do. And I just love to see the city full of people, you know. I wouldn't like to live in a big city or, or a city that's constantly that busy uh, year-round, but in the summertime it's a nice, mm -hmm. it's a nice thing to be in there. It does make for a nice diversity, a nice break. It does. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mrs. Henry, uh, that's been all the questions we have for our forum. Uh, Feel free to contact me anytime you want to if you have some other recollections or memories or anything that you want to mention there. I, well, I'm talking to some friends the other night about this oral history. We were talking about some of the events, some of the things that we did as kids that mm -hmm. I think I may have uh, let slip by. Mm, that's uh, one of the things was that we did a lot of swimming. Swimming? Yeah, and mm -hmm. we, in the summertime we would go in the morning and stay all day long. We didn't go to the beach because of the waves, you know. We uh, we spent a lot of time uh, at Van Zandt Avenue and Elm Street Pier. 
and the Blue Rocks. Mm -hmm. and the, the real name is Battery Park, but we yes. call it the Blue Rocks. Blue Rocks? Mm -hmm. Oh, and because of the rock, color the of the rocks. Color the rocks, yeah. Oh, okay. And we used to spend all day long there, um, swimming, diving off the piers, mm -hmm. and uh, picking up, then you could pick up crabs, you could pick up cohogs, mussels, and things right off the beach, right off the water, right there. Mm -hmm. And um, that changed because you can no longer get crabs down there now unless you go way, way out. Oh, no, is that right? Uh, but we used to pick them up, at, you know, huh. every day. And then we did a lot of um, roller skating. We roller skated in the streets because uh, although they had a couple of rinks, they were way out, you know, out of our neighborhood. So we roller skated in the street until they made a law that it was against the law to skate on the street. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, on the sidewalk? On the sidewalks and in the street. Oh, and they said it was illegal on it sidewalks was, too? Yes, it's illegal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and we did a lot of uh, oh, bicycle riding. We used to rent bicycles for 50 cents an hour on mm -hmm. Sundays. And we would rent the bicycles for four hours and ride all over the city. Um, where were the shops you were in? There, there was a shop on the corner of West Broadway and Marlboro Street, right in that area. A bicycle shop. And we used to rent bikes there every Sunday. <laughs> and uh, it, as long as it wasn't raining, you know. And we would ride uh, down 10th Street and then uh, sometimes along Bellevue Avenue and down Marlboro Road, I mean uh, Bath Road, past Eastern Speech and out to Second Beach, and around by Purgatory Rock, mm. you know, and mm -hmm. just to see how many hills we could climb, you know, after <laughs> riding a long distance. And, uh, we spent a lot of time doing that. Do you recall that the traffic, the automobile traffic, was uh, less heavy at that time? Oh, yes, a lot less heavy. Yeah. Uh, the difference you notice now is kids have cars. I must have been, I guess, 20 years old before I even started driving. But my kids were all 15 or 16 when they learned how to drive, you know. So it's a lot less traffic. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard you say, <coughs> excuse me, Thames Street. I know a lot of people pronounce it as they do in England, I guess, which is named after the river. It's Some say Thames. Uh, have you figured out what's the, the Newport The correct <laughs> pronunciation is Thames. It's supposed to be like England. Uh, but um, most Newporters say Thames. I, they pronounce it the same way it's written. It's written. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's the correct pronunciation is Tim's. Okay. I was wondering if you pronounced it that way because you knew it was correct or because most Newporters did. Well, because, um, probably because we were corrected in school. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Some things do stick. <laughs> I guess that's about all I can remember. Um, I used to bicycle riding, roller skating, and on the piers. Yeah. Uh, Very good. Those are things that we do kids. I, I don't know, kids nowadays have um, a different idea of, of what's fun. Those things were fun to us. Mm -hmm. you know? and, uh, kids today you know, aren't interested in roller skating, aren't interested in spending that much time. They, they want pools. If they're going to go swimming, they want to swim in a pool, you know. Uh, it wasn't any fun for us to go to a pool. It wasn't any fun to go to the beach, you know, because it was all sand and seaweed and waves and you just mm -hmm. can't swim in that, you know. But the water off of uh, Battery Park was much more pleasant. Much more pleasant. There's a lot of glass and rocks down there, but once you got out, so, mm -hmm. you know, it was easier to swim. <clears throat> swimming down that area, was that, was it, a lot of your friends in the neighborhood would go down and use that area? Was everybody. that mostly the West Broadway neighborhood that tended to use that? Um, everybody from all over the city came. Oh. Yeah. We had what we call the Hilltoppers that lived like Bellevue Avenue, 11th Street, uh, William Street, and around in that area, and they would all come down to um, the Elm Street Pier and 
Vincent Avenue Pier. And then once in a while we would go, we'd meet them at the Ann Street Pier, which is further down Ann Street. Mm -hmm. you know, and so, but everybody from all over the city came in. Mm. 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 Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have